welcome back to a very special episode of Hand Tool Rescue. As you can notice, I am talking. I am going to narrate this video for you because there is so much to talk about, so much to demonstrate that I couldn't possibly get it done without explaining a little bit verbally for everyone here. This is an Ottawa Manufacturing Company drag saw or log saw. Uh, it is most likely made uh, in the 1920s, and I have it here for you and I to go through today. This entire tool was uh, purchased using the support from Patreon, so I'm going to narrate this video like I do on Patreon uh, as kind of a, a thank you to all of the patrons who supported this effort. It is a, a massive tool. This thing's about 12 feet long, four or five feet wide. It's just crazy, crazy. I love it. So the first step here is getting the piston unstuck. Uh, there's nothing like a little bit of heat to help with anything that's stuck. And in this case, it actually worked as well. Um, the actual piston I don't remember being stuck when I got this, and this was a few years ago. If you actually watch the end of my antique flamethrower video, you can see I say that this tool restoration is coming soon, and that was about three years ago. So I'm finally getting to it. Uh, it just took, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of time apparently. So with the piston unstuck, uh, I can check to see if we have spark. Uh, with the spark plug and the magneto, in which we don't, unfortunately. So that's going to be a, an issue that I'm going to have to tackle further on. Uh, there may be just something wrong with the points, like usual, but I will have to sort that out when I get there. The muffler is just a straight pipe with holes drilled in it. Original muffler for this was essentially this exact same thing. Uh, some people just didn't even put any mufflers on it, so... No need to worry about that design. The gas tank is completely empty. I just tried draining it there and nothing is coming out except rust and dust. So uh, I will obviously have to clean that later. In starting to take this apart, I I'm just kind of going from the outside in, in terms of the engine. I don't want to mess around too much with uh, the timing that we have here between the valves uh, and the piston and the gearing on the flywheel. It's all set very specifically. And because all of this information is somewhat lost to time, I, I don't want to get myself too deep into trouble here. Uh, so I'm going to take things apart, but keep them kind of whole uh, in the sense that every unit, um, like the valves or the head or the cylinder, is going to kind of stay together and I will clean around uh, the parts while they are fully assembled in, in some cases. Here I'm just taking off the valve springs. They're not tight enough that I, I can't put them back on or take them off without using special tools. All I need is, is my hand and it's, it's very simple. You can already start to see near the top of the uh, cylinder head here, there's some repairs. Uh, those were most likely done at some point previous to me, uh, of course. I purchased this from uh, someone in Ontario, Canada, and I am not sure if they were the ones that did the repairs or not, but either way, it is something you're going to have to investigate and have a look at and see if the repairs are adequate or if they need uh, to be redone. The repairs look like they're due to frost damage, this is where water would flow to keep the engine cool, and if you didn't drain that uh, in the winter, the cast iron can't expand, and therefore you get some cracking. With the valves off, I can test to see if they actually do seal, which is incredibly important for the function of uh, this type of engine, which is a four-stroke. And it seems like they do. Uh, after a while of me leaving the, the uh, gasoline there, it didn't seep through at all, the level didn't lower, so I, I'm kind of confident and very happy I don't need to lap those, but maybe we'll give them a little grind anyways. This is the Wico Magneto. Those are getting harder and harder to find. Uh, 
Uh, I'm not really sure uh, what I would do if this one could not be repaired because a new one is about five or six hundred dollars. They don't make them anymore, so it's just people kind of uh, assembling their own using parts found online. Now that things are moving, I can start to try and take the whole flywheel and crankshaft mechanism off. Uh, and I'm slowly discovering what parts need to be taken off first in order to get to what I need to get to, uh, to take all of this apart. And it's really a puzzle that you have to solve uh, very slowly by making mistakes. You know, I'm unscrewing this here and it doesn't come off uh, because the larger gear is in the way. And I thought it would just lift out anyways, but it's not doing that. So there's kind of a lot of uh, guesswork being done and just kind of a, an investigative approach to taking apart uh, a tool this complex. I don't deal with four-stroke engines very frequently, uh, especially on this channel. So this is kind of a first for video on this channel. And these are the Babbitt bearings. You've seen me pour Babbitt before in this in the saw filer um, episode. But you can see the actual crankshaft is in fantastic condition. Beautiful condition. Nice and shiny still. No rusting, no scoring. So I'm very happy with that. I, I hope that the rest of the crankshaft is in the, a similar condition. The Babbitt bearings on the actual... Uh, attached to where the piston is there's a lot of uh, dirt and dust kind of around it but that also seems to be completely fine so crankshaft is glorious very excited about that the counterweights on the crankshaft are a special feature of the ottawa engine um, they apparently advertise this as something that helps the engine run smoother with less kind of rocking more balanced and I guess it, it does make sense. Uh, it is a nice little addition. These right here are the cam gears uh, that help with the timing of the valves and the magneto. They're very important to time with the flywheel that's in red in the forefront. Very specifically, I've marked them and stamped them uh, just in case what is there is correct. Um, but I won't know until I, I put it all back together. I'm trying to get this off and not really understanding why it isn't coming off. And then I discover there's a shaft and uh, a piece that kind of encapsulates that shaft attached to the clutch here. So in order to get that off, it looks like I'm going to have to take everything else apart uh, that relates to the actual sawing mechanism. So I'm trying to take the actual saw blade off. It's just two bolts attached to uh, an arm and the saw itself is five feet long. So you could cut most likely uh, just under a five foot log, which is incredibly wide, uh, much wider than I've ever come across where I live. Now we can see the clutch moving and the bigger gearing moving, getting excited. Um, as we break this down further, because I really, really want to take this entire flywheel off so I can see what's going on. Um, but the actual sawing arm that transfers the motion to the saw uh, rides along these two rails, and you can kind of see on the right. Uh, and then a, a wooden piece helps move that uh, arm back and forth as the flywheel turns. It's a, a smart and simple design meant to mimic uh, men or women actually sawing. Uh, it's, it's crazy that it's just a piece of wood with oil holes and holes for the actual shafting and then that was it. They didn't bother making a piece of casting for some reason for that specific part. Maybe it was breaking too often or couldn't handle certain twists. I'm not exactly sure why that part would be wood, but it is original, uh, as all the other ones I've seen have that exact same design. Okay, now finally with the sawing arm off, I'm hoping I can get the red flywheel and crankshaft off. Here we have the clutch removed, and then behind it is the safety clutch. Uh, that 
stops the saw from moving, uh, but allows the engine to keep turning. So in case the saw actually was to bind in a log, uh, you, the whole saw wouldn't explode and kill everyone. Uh, it's just a nice feature, a very nice feature. You can also see where the crankshaft rides on, um, where the Babbitt bearings are. They're at a 45 degree angle to the piston and instead of just kind of perpendicular to it. And that was a, a potentially advertised feature uh, to help kind of absorb that impact better than um, better than something that was perpendicular. That's at least what they advertised. So I'm just using a piece of wood to lightly tap out the massive six inch piston. Uh, this thing is bigger than anything I've dealt with before by far. Uh, it's very it's very interesting but the top piston ring is actually stuck. So that is a, a major issue that we'll need to address uh, when we get to that point. I'm hoping to remove the entire engine block at once here. Uh, it's not crazy, crazy heavy, uh, but it's heavy enough that I, I don't think I can lift it up onto my workbench by myself without destroying my entire life. So I'm not gonna do that. The gas tank or kerosene tank, in some cases, uh, are, is just nailed on to the wooden frame hidden under the engine block. Extremely inconvenient location to fill the tank up, especially if you have any tank issues, but uh, that's just the way it is. Once you remove the nails, it just pops off. It also rides on these little uh, wooden slats for extra support, I guess. This part is near the front of the saw, uh, and it's the winch that you would use to hook on to a log and tighten it uh, nice and tight so that the actual sawing tool here, the drag saw, is attached to the log in a more firm manner as to not create violent shaking and therefore danger. Now we move on to the special portion of the episode where it takes me everything on earth to remove one single bolt and nut combination because it's just so stubborn, so rusty that it just doesn't want to cooperate. I'm trying, you know, everything I, I, I know initially you got to kind of do a stepwise process. You don't go straight out to, you know, liquefying the bolt. Uh, because these are really massive square bolts, and I love square bolts and nuts, and I try to salvage them uh, when I can, and I really want to salvage these because these are some of the larger ones I've seen. And apparently it requires to me to whip out the large wrench. The big boy. Uh, this is the largest one I have currently, and even that is helping, but it's not solving the problem. So I'm going to have to remove this wheel because it's in my way. And I can't get a good uh, leverage angle on it, so this needs to go. And uh, I might as well just start taking apart everything else that at least comes apart easily uh, compared to this set of nuts and bolts. So the other wheel is here. These turn so that you can position them either parallel or perpendicular to the log to stop a kind of rocking back and forth motion. Makes it a little more stable. But we do see something that needs to be repaired here. One of the spokes is completely damaged. Looks like there's a previous repair on it, but we'll have to investigate that after. This part right here is the bottom of the wooden parts of the drag saw. And these are holding on the uh, little handle shelf that holds the saw up off the ground when not in use. So obviously important, so we must get that off. I am trying once again to salvage the nuts and bolts as much as I can. Um, because I do really like those square nuts and bolts. Even the, the modern square nuts and bolts are, are just not the same. They don't have those nice sharp corners. What I'm using here is an eight point socket. Uh, 
Uh, you can get a full set of these. They still make them. Uh, they're probably a little more expensive than normal ones, but not out of anyone's crazy price range. So it should be fine. But these obviously aren't coming out because they've been peened over and damaged over time. So I'm just going to probably grind them off and just uh, leave it as that, unfortunately. I'm going back and forth along the wooden uh, parts of the uh, log saw. Just trying to wiggle this over here, jiggle that, loosen this, just trying to get everything off that I can uh, that isn't completely stuck and, and murdered. But, you know, you're only so successful. A lot of these are carriage bolts, which are my arch nemesis, because I cannot absolutely stand carriage bolts, only because there's really no way to grab the other end of the bolt. It's rounded over. So if the nut doesn't want to come off, the only way to get it off is either cut it off or really uh, damage the head of the carriage bolt, which is not really the, the style. So I'm not into that. Especially in wood, it's horrendous, especially a hundred year old wood. You can hear how dry and crusty the wood is. So at this point, I'm beginning to think that I need to repair the wood as well. And it's probably a full replace because there's so many cracks. There's so much rot over the last hundred years that I'm thinking I need to replace this entire piece of wood. And when I have that realization, I can then just treat it uh, more aggressively than I would otherwise. Here, I'm finally getting some progress on taking off. Uh, that nut off that bolt, but now the entire bolt is spinning uh, because it hates me. So, this is really the only next logical step is to get it red hot and then give it a go. It should be fine. Rust is an insulator, so the rust in the threads is enough to kind of insulate the heat from the bolt. Uh, to the actual nut. So there is a difference in temperature between the two and that difference is enough uh, that it loosens off very easily. And that's kind of how the heating works. I know people get confused a little bit that, oh, you're heating up the inside of the bolt uh, or the inside threads as well. And then that's just kind of gives you an explanation on how that works. So we're finally off, bolt is saved, nuts are saved, I'm happy. Uh, but, you know, there's always another one to try and destroy everything. And I do get uh, this one off, but I break the entire bolt in half trying to get the other one off. Even with lots of heat, you can see I'm tr not trying to touch it with my hands. It just didn't want to, I, I failed I guess. That's unfortunate. Uh, I do get it off eventually, just for keeping it, uh, since it's so large, but uh, I broke it, so I'm going to have to order new square bolts uh, for that. Right here is one of the feet, and that would stab onto the actual log, and that also helps it not move back and forth, uh, since a lot of these older engines like really are not the most well-balanced things on Earth. Here I'm taking off the quote-unquote carburetor, which is really just a mixture. Uh, so it just mixes air with gasoline. Obviously that's what a carburetor does, but this is just a Venturi system as it sucks air in through the front. Uh, it also sucks in gasoline due to the flow of air. Uh, and that's literally it. There's no pump, there's no diaphragm. Uh, there's nothing like that. So it's very, very, very simple design. The left side, where I just took that piece of sheet metal off, is where you would put gasoline um, and run the motor off of gasoline for just a few minutes so that you can then transfer it over to kerosene because kerosene doesn't like uh, lighting in low temperatures, so the engine needs to really be hot in order to work off of kerosene. So that's why there's that second half of this uh, carburetor 
It's very odd. Uh, but at the time, kerosene was, was cheaper than gasoline, and that's kind of how it was. This is the drain plug for that side, that uh, kerosene side, if you wish to call it that. And it's fine. It doesn't seem to be leaking, but uh, I'll fix that when needed. This right here is the set screw for the needle valve. I took out the actual uh, needle portion earlier, but this valve seat is all that regulates the inflow of the gasoline or the kerosene. I'm thinking twice about messing with the throttle linkage here. So I'm going to leave that attached. I don't want to mess with that right now. I'm going to investigate the rest of the cylinder head here. And these gaskets are new. Err. Uh, they are the cork rubber hybrid, which um, is, is unlikely to be original. So there's definitely been some work done to this. I don't exactly know when. Um, but someone touched this, uh, so I got to do some investigation here. This black paint isn't original either, and it comes off incredibly easily, um, which exposes the brazing, and the brazing definitely matches up with frost cracks in the in the water portion of the cooling system, uh, and it looks okay, but th there are parts that are showing cracks and parts on the actual face of the uh, cylinder head there that worry me so we might need to rebraze some parts here i'm tackling the stuck piston ring now these piston rings are cast iron and as you know cast iron doesn't really like to flex a lot so this is pretty much the maximum amount of flex i'm going to put on this i'm being extremely gentle finding piston rings for this is probably difficult and or expensive so I'm just taking my time and pulsing and pumping the ring and using its own tension to help it break free from the carbon buildup or the rust and, and that was the reason why the piston was stuck so I'm just kind of stabbing little by little I'm not going to pry like a psycho I'm just going to go very lightly and pump this until it breaks free and just the motion will do the work. And then it just pops. And it's finally free. And I'm very happy about that. I'll go in with a little screwdriver or a little pick. And clean out all the carbon. Might even dump this whole thing in the uh, ultrasonic cleaner. Just to see if it will take off any more of that. But it really needs to, to move freely. The ring must spin uh, freely. Even though it has a position that it locks into, it can't be stuck. We can't have air flowing by it. So I'm dealing with the actual uh, uh, rest of the piston here, and I noticed the chunks of Babbitt coming off. So it looks like where the previous person that poured the Babbitt scored the oil holes, they went too deep and actually cracked it. So that is something I'm going to have to deal with, obviously. They may have used the wrong type of Babbitt, and by that I mean tin-based Babbitt instead of lead-based Babbitt is great for higher speed, higher impact applications. Uh, there is also a Babbitt with a little bit more copper in it, and that can lead to an even higher impact resistant Babbitt. So one of those two is probably optimal, probably the tin-based one, because... Uh, of its ability to handle higher speeds better, in which case this would be perfect. So I'm going to have to purchase some of that high-speed Babbitt, and it is quite expensive, but you only need a little bit of it. And I can definitely use it in future projects. This arm here was interesting. These bolts that I'm tapping out, they really don't look original, but I couldn't get a good shot of what was supposed to be there. Uh, and you can see the kind of double holes drilled in uh, to that casting there. Then I'm noticing that there's a massive repair over here as well. Someone just put like a motor, electric motor coupling welded to this casting here. And the bronze bushings, and I think there are actually two, are epoxied in place instead of press fit, which probably is another issue in itself. So it's kind of interesting to see what has been done over the years. The function is probably completely fine. 
which is all I need to focus on at, at this point. Here you can see the bronze bush, and it's incredibly loose. Like, it's massively undersized. I don't know if they just had this size only and just said, okay, whatever, just put it in, or they did that on purpose. I'm also realizing that the rest of these, the ones that aren't damaged, are filled with Babbitt as well. So I don't know if I need to repour those or not. Um, you don't want them too tight, too tight, and that safety clutch is going to slip every single time and you're not going to get any sign done. So there's probably a balance there that I need to sort out. The grease cups are still grease cupping, squeezing that Nutella out. Um, both of them are working fine, so I will... Uh, clean those out as needed and replace it with fresh grease. But the actual Babbitt material in these bearing caps are very nice. So I don't need to worry too much about that. The rest of the engine parts, uh, I'm just going to take apart whole, like I was talking about earlier. This is the mount for the Magneto, and this is the governor uh, that helps control the speed, and it's attached to the throttle linkage. Um, you can set it on, I believe, four different speeds from 200 to 350 RPM uh, using that lever there on the left. And I'm keeping this completely assembled right now. I don't know exactly how this works. There's no <laughs> literature on it. So I need to be very careful I don't ruin this and get this completely apart before I know what I'm doing. I don't like to do that. It's not safe. You could ruin something or put it back together incorrectly and either kill yourself or others or just damage the actual tool. Not what I'm into. I am putting literally everything that is metal into this evaporist bin. So eventually, and I don't show it here, I put the entire engine block into this um, Bin. I had a friend come and help me load it in the entire thing with all the cracks, with everything. I just wanted to get all of the rust off everywhere. There's no other way to do it in this case. Here I'm working on the saw. So I just sprayed it with some penetrating oil and then I go over it with the orbital sander and this knocks off the majority of the surface rust. And it, it does a really good job. It doesn't leave swirls and, and marks. It, it looks really good. And I could have just left it as is. But I have a rust problem. So I'm going to go with the gel for this. It doesn't fit in my tub without half of it fitting. And if you put something halfway in a Vaporust, it'll create an etch line. I don't want to do that. So I just hit it with the gel, uh, waited a few hours, and then sanded the dry gel off. And that gets the rust away from the pitted areas, which is very important. That saw will be pretty much kept oiled or waxed uh, in use, so I'm not too worried about it getting worse with rust uh, if I don't oil it immediately. I always find random things, and there was an axe for some reason in the evaporous bin. I don't even remember putting it in there. Anyways, the piston's coming out, and the rest of the parts are coming out. And I do this frequently, but not always. These parts are going in before paint has been stripped because I actually cannot see what color the paint is on these things because the photos online are obviously modern photos and any original uh, documents are all illustrations with different colors uh, that made it just bring what the printer had. It, it, it's weird. So I'm discovering that some parts are green and some parts are red and that may or may not match up with what I found online. So it's beginning to be a little confusing. On here it just looks like there's absolutely nothing. So I'm not entirely sure what these colors were, but based on other Ottawa engines, most likely the entire engine portion was green and the flywheel and some other parts were red. It's almost a Christmas style uh, drag saw. The muffler seems to be homemade, but it's completely adequate, so I'm, I'm totally fine with that. 
I'm gonna start repairing as many things as I can. There is original bronze that was used here for brazing. Someone did that at some point, but the braze did not stick properly. Uh, maybe they didn't get it hot enough or just shut it off for some reason. So I'm gonna get it as hot as I can uh, and rebraze that material. The brazing is difficult uh, here because I didn't fully remove the previous brazing. Uh, I did sand it down and, and all that to get to a fresh surface, but it's difficult. And here with the actual cylinder head, you can see I've taken parts out with uh, a die grinder, and these were all pits and, and little cracks that I didn't like. I wanted a nice clean brass or bronze surface. Uh, so I'm trying to braze bronze into bronze brazing that was previously brazed. And it's incredibly difficult because the brazing is going to melt at the exact same temperature uh, as the brazing rod. And it's incredibly difficult to do. It's one of the hardest brazing uh, attempts I've ever done. But after that was done, I went with a file and made sure this surface was completely flat, or as flat as I could get it. And then I noticed a, a crack in the engine block, and this is the bottom of the engine block, kind of where the carburetor was sitting. And it's a huge crack, uh, so that's not okay. So what we're going to do in this case is fix this, which is much easier to fix than going into bronze itself. and. Uh, fill it in with brazing, sand it down, and then fill it over with clear epoxy. You probably could use uh, the steel reinforced epoxy as well, but I like to use the clear for this application. And then I take a bunch of cast iron dust that I ground on the belt grinder and sprinkle it on top as liberally as you possibly can to soak into the epoxy and to sit on top as well. You have to cast iron bay it and then once it is dry you can give it some texture and I'm using a needle scaler here uh, to go crazy over this thing and that'll give it the, the texture of cast iron so you don't even notice at all that this is here and that's the goal. This repair I don't want to show off. might want to show off the big braised part on the cylinder head so you can't even notice here. Completely fine. So, very happy with how that turned out. I'll flatten this as well, uh, as as kind of quickly as I can. I'm not going to go crazy and remove, you know, a quarter inch of material. But I just need to get it at least level enough that uh, the gasket will seat well. I'm going to hone this, the actual cylinder, very quickly, very lightly, uh, just to get rid of any kind of residual stuff that has been left over from the piston being stuck or years of, of use. The piston is fine, but the cylinder is heavily pitted. Usually, that would be a cause for concern, but in these older engines, the compression in the chamber that the piston and cylinder provide is two or three times the, the amount of pressure that you have outside in, in the normal air. So it, it really is not getting compressed a lot. So having these pits in the cylinder wall is not really an issue. You can run these engines on an incredibly low compression. Not to mention we're using a, a heavier weight oil, a 30 weight oil goes into that. So that'll help kind of fill in those pits and they may just be nice little oil reservoirs. I am now tackling that linkage arm for the saw and just stabbing around with the die grinder to clean up any holes or weird spots that might have rust or something. I need to clean this whole area up because it, it was repaired and I don't need it any worse. So I'm going to remove the bronze bushings in here, remove all the old epoxy and put in new bronze bushings that fit new uh, slides so everything is running smoothly. I added metal epoxy here so I can shape and blend the repair in better than 
what was done previously. I almost don't want you to notice that this was a repair. You'll still be able to tell probably, but if you just glance at it quickly, it won't stick out at you. And you're saying, oh man, that, that's brutal. So you can see I'm much beefier. Uh, bronze bushings are going in and that makes me very happy. I'm not going to make the actual rods that that arm slides on uh, with the metal lathe. I like to do a skim pass just to remove the uh, mill scale on the rods and then I'll go uh, crazy and get down to size. I need to reduce this to the size uh, that it initially was, I think it was initially 5 8 and then uh, I need to thread about a, an inch of, of the end of this. The metal lathe is doing a decent job. It sounds a little like it wants to die, but that's only because uh, the belt on it is actually an original leather belt and the linkage between the belt is metal and it, and it really sounds horrendous. I'm going to start the die on the lathe just one or two turns and then I'll finish it off by hand on the vise. I, I really should be threading this on the lathe, but I don't have the quick change box set up for this specific lathe, unfortunately. And changing all the gears is a nightmare, so I'm not going to do that. There's the collar going back on, and you can see it's looking good. Very good. I basically matched it exactly, except for the length of the threading, because I felt like that was unnecessary, uh, and having that extra surface area there would be helpful. Now, in order to fix the connecting rod, I need to drill a hole to pour Babbitt into because I want to use the other perfect Babbitt uh, bearing cap as a reference surface for the pour of this one. Otherwise, I would have to remove both of them, set up a, an elaborate setup to perfectly line up uh, the crankshaft and and I just don't need to do that if I already have a service So I'm gonna have to do that a little bit. Here is the fantastically expensive $350 piece of Babbitt You don't get a lot of it uh, But you don't really need a lot of it. So Once it's molten You literally pour it in and there's the hole and I've packed it with uh, almost like a putty around it, a special made high temp putty around the entire uh, crankshaft and bearing cap and then come back when it's a little bit cool and take off all of that and see how I've done. And it looks to be good. This should be solid, just absolutely solid. There's no play basically at all um, if you've done this right. And that seems to be the case. I'm trying to even get it to move and it's getting brutal. It doesn't move side to side. It's glorious. Absolutely glorious. So I'm, I'm happy with this. It needs um, the actual shims removed and the areas cleaned up, but the actual main pour of the Babbitt bearing seems to be fine and I'm very happy with that. I'm going to try and put the piston back in so I can line up um, everything as well as I can. I did spend time lining up the connecting rod uh, perfectly so that it's not going to be skewed in one way or the other. That's the only thing I really need to pay attention to at the, at, at the time of pouring. But I didn't actually have a way of getting these uh, piston rings compressed because my piston ring compressor only goes to three inches. So I just had a band clamp and, and use that. It seems to be fine. I had to do that because uh, I wanted to line up the oil hole, which I am drilling out right now. And near the top is where the grease cup goes. So I need to make sure that it goes through. And I'm checking that with a little air gun and if air can get through then grease from the grease cup can get through and I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm also going to score the Babbitt for the grease to flow. Uh, sometimes it's just called oil lines in a specific pattern that uh, doesn't really matter in this case. Uh, I just don't want to go so deep that it's an absolute nightmare like uh, the cracking that happened. Here I'm using a Babbitt scraper. It's a specially designed tool for scraping Babbitt bearings. That'll kind of remove any burrs or 
whatever uh, is not perfectly flush. Then when I remove the higher spots around the shims, I can screw it all together and have a test and it seems to be totally fine. Next, I need to make the wooden parts completely using my massive 16 inch circular saw, but that is going to have to wait until the next video. This is a massive project, so I really need the time uh, to get things together, but thank you for watching and I will see you all in the next one. Later.